Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Peace Health webinar on heart valve disease therapies, the new frontier. This information today that will be presented is general in nature and doesn't replace the advice for your personal health care provider. So we do encourage you to talk with your doctor about specific questions that are related to your health conditions or your diet. Uh, I, I am Summer Meyer, and I will be your moderator today. Before I introduce our guest speaker, I do want to remind you that Peace Health is ready to help when you need us. Many of our doctors offer video visit appointments, so if you haven't done so already, be sure to set up your My Peace Health account so you can make appointments, track your vaccinations, receive your test results, and manage your prescriptions. If you already have an account, make sure you log in and make sure that your contact information is up to date with us. In today's webinar, I do wanna invite you to engage with us by voting in the polls, asking questions, and taking our survey at the very end. So with that housekeeping out of the way, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you our speaker today, Dr. Banerjee. Dr. Banerjee joined Sacred Heart Medical Center's Oregon Heart and Vascular Institute in 2011 after completing her fellowships in cardiology and interventional cardiology at Barnes Jewish Hospital in St. Louis, Missouri. She attended medical school at the University of Missouri and completed her residency at Case Western Reserve University. Her professional interests include interventional cardiology and structural heart disease. Outside of work, she enjoys outdoor activities, traveling, and cooking, but lately uh, she spends most of her time running around after her three-year-old. So welcome and thank you for being with us here today, Dr. Banerjee. I'll pass it over to you to get us started on valvular heart disease. Thank you so much, Summer. I'm so excited to be here. And this is a subject that's really near and dear to my heart because things have evolved so much and we've become so blessed to have multiple technologies to treat our patients. And that's always so satisfying. So number one, what is valvular heart disease? So heart valve disease occurs when your heart valves don't work the way they should. And I'll go into that a little bit here. So your heart anatomy, you have four chambers to your heart. The top two chambers are the collecting chambers. They collect blood back from the body. And the bottom two chambers are the pumping chambers. Each chamber is connected to the next by a one-way valve. So when the blood is moving forward, it doesn't leak back. You can see the right side of the heart has two valves, as does the left. The right side of the heart pumps blood to the lungs to pick up the oxygen, and then the left side of the heart pumps blood all the way to the tips of your toes and back, providing that oxygen-rich blood to all your vital organs. And for that reason, we see more disease on the left side and with those left-sided valves because there's more force and pressure and more wear and tear. There's two major valve diseases or problems that can affect your heart valves. The first is a blockage. So you can imagine your heart valves work very well when they can open to allow that blood to move forward. But if they get narrow for any reason and you don't get enough blood through, you can't get that oxygen rich blood to your vital organs and you can get symptoms from that. Similarly, if your valve opens well, but doesn't form a nice tight seal when it closes, then you're gonna get that leaking backwards that allows for fluid accumulation in your body and also results in less blood going where it needs, where it's needed, such as your muscles and your organs. Every one of your four major heart valves can be diseased with either narrowing or leaking. But the two major ones that ones we see the most often are aortic valve disease and mitral valve disease, because those are those left-sided valves that I told you about. And again, just over time, they get more wear and tear. And so you can see narrowing or leaking of either of those or narrowing and leaking of the tricuspid or pulmonic valves as well. 
we're going to focus on aortic stenosis and mitral regurgitation because they are the most common. We have the best technology for them, and that technology often gets applied to the other valvular heart disease. I think it's time for a poll. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Banerjee. So yes, um, I'm going to go ahead and launch a poll for you to complete. We would love to hear from you. Um, what heart condition concerns you the most? And so you should be seeing that poll in just a second. There we go. So go ahead and vote. And that'll give us kind of a good idea of why uh, our audience is here today and inform the rest of our presentation for you. Great, looks like we've got about 52% and climbing. So I'll leave the poll open for another few seconds here. Go ahead and get your votes in now. Excellent. People are still actively completing that. If you don't have any concerns, maybe you're here for an educational purpose, feel free to let us know that too by typing in the chat function of this tool and that way we'll be able to capture if you're here for some other reason. Great, okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and close out the poll. Final chance to get those results in. And here we go. Okay, so now we'll share these out so you can see um, of our attendees today, what does it look like um, is most concerning, Dr. Banerjee? So, so interesting, 49% are here because they're interested in aortic stenosis, 34% because of mitral regurgitation, 10% because of another heart condition, and 7% don't have another don't have a specific concern. And I think that's great because that really reflects what I'm going to talk about today. So it's really pertinent. Yeah, yeah. And it looks like a few folks have also typed into the chat. Um, some are sharing that high blood pressure concerns, um, aortic regurgitation is something listed. So a couple of um, couple of unique responses here as we as we move forward. Let me go ahead and hide these results for us now and I'll transition us back to the slide deck. Thank you so much, Summer. So just like it seems reflected in the audience, um, mitral valve and aortic valve disease, you can see that green line and the blue line on this graph reflect the majority of the valve disease we see in our population. And you can see that if you look at age 45 to 75 along that bottom line, that the incidence of valve disease really increases with age. And it's not a lot to do with diet or exercise, but genetics and just aging and wear and tear. And to the point that almost 10% of patients over age 75 will have some kind of valve disease. Often people feel overwhelmed when they hear that statistic because they think, okay, I'm 75, I don't have a valve disease, what should I be feeling? And so I want to explain that a little bit further and tell you that just because you have a murmur or a leaky or narrow valve, like the, the patient today or person who let us know they had aortic regurgitation, it doesn't mean that you need to do anything about it at this point. We often wait until the disease is severely narrow or severely leaky before we do a procedure. Once the valve gets severely diseased, you'll have symptoms. And the symptoms are associated with not getting enough blood where it needs to go or that backing up of fluid so that you're retaining fluid and volume in your body. So this is a really nice pictogram that shows you that if you don't get enough blood to your brain, you can get dizzy or lightheaded. If you start retaining fluid in your lungs because you can't push that blood forward effectively, you can get a cough or shortness of breath. If blood doesn't return to your heart when you need it, when you're working hard, you can have chest pain. Or if you're having too much flu fluid accumulating in your heart itself, it can get irritated and flutter. 
Other places that fluid can accumulate are your abdomen or your legs, causing swelling in your legs or an abdominal fullness. Some people get full more quickly or don't have the appetite they used to. And then fainting and weakness are also um, signs of not getting enough blood where you need it to go. Um, patients often tell me that they're just not as able to be as active as they want. But by far, the two biggest complaints that I have when patients come to see me with valve disease are fatigue. And then people say, I'm just getting old. I feel like I just got old this year or in the last two months or the last several weeks. And aging should be imperceptible. You shouldn't feel it that quickly. And so that's always a big red flag for me. So when should you see a doctor? When should you worry if you, if you think that something may be going on? Often people have murmurs all their lives. And so if you have a physician that you're seeing regularly, they'll be following that to, to tell you if this is just a benign murmur, a mild disease, or something they need to start following yearly or looking for other signs and symptoms. If you have symptoms of chest pain, breathing problems at rest, or when you're trying to do something, or fluid buildup, whether it's in your abdomen or legs, and especially fainting episodes, passing out without having a cause, it's important to see your doctor, whether it's your primary care provider, your cardiologist, your nurse practitioner. It's important to, to be an advocate for yourself, find out what's going on, and determine what the cause is. And the, and the cause will not always be valve disease. Breathing problems can be due to the lungs. Chest pain can be due to heart blockages. Fainting can be due to brain issues or even rhythm issues. But any of these are hallmarks of something that needs to be evaluated or worked up. The testing that we use whenever any of these complaints come by are pretty standard for, heart, for the heart. We always do an ECG, which is a baseline tracing of your heart to, to see, is there a rhythm problem here? Is there a sign of something else that's going on that could cause these symptoms? A chest X-ray is so useful to tell us about, breathe, about fluid buildup or to see if this is a lung issue rather than a heart issue. An echocardiogram is our gold standard for val valvular heart disease. It's an ultrasound where you can see the four chambers of the heart and visualize those four valves to see if there's any leaking or narrowing across them. It's often what makes the diagnosis for us. A stress test is a, is a very classic way to determine if chest pain is due to blockages in the arteries feeding your heart, and that can be often part of our program in terms of assessing for heart disease. A CT or MRI, whether if it's the chest, the heart, or the brain are important, depending on what symptoms you come in. And those are special x-rays that can help us define whether those organs are working normally or not. And then finally, blood tests. Surprisingly, it could be a simple blood test telling us about your blood counts that could explain fatigue or shortness of breath or fainting, just as well as these other tests. But it's important to be complete. And these are some tests that you might expect if you're having some of these symptoms that we, that we talked about earlier. So what is aortic stenosis? The normal aortic valve you can see there on the left has three leaflets. And so these leaflets are thin and flexible and they open about the size of a half dollar. As one gets older, not everyone, but maybe someone with a genetic predisposition or someone who's exposed to something in the environment, you can get thickening of those valve, heart leaflets. And it's not that the, that the valve gets blocked up, it's just that the leaflets get thickened and inflexible. So now they can't open as wide as they used to. So it's like putting your thumb over a hose. You just, you get blood out and it comes out faster, which is that murmur that you hear, but you don't get as much. So when you're resting, you're fine because you don't need as much blood and oxygen. You don't require as much. But as soon as you try to go do something, you don't get enough blood to your vital organs. You can get those symptoms of dizziness and lightheadedness, chest pain, shortness of breath. Aortic stenosis can be mild, moderate, or severe. And there's different therapies based on those severities. At the beginning, when it's mild, we often make sure that we have echocardiograms, that ultrasound of your heart, 
every two years or so until it gets moderate, and then probably every year until it gets severe, just to make sure that we're monitoring you closely. You'll see your primary care provider or cardiologist at those same frequencies to make sure that you're not having any symptoms of fluid buildup or lack of blood flow. Lifestyle modifications is something we always stress because it's important once you have valve disease to stay with a low salt diet so you don't give your body any other reason to accumulate fluid or build up any of that extra fluid in your lungs or your legs. And staying active is incredibly important no matter what is going on because when the rest of your body is in shape, it takes the burden off the heart and it makes it easier for the rest for your heart to work and for your whole body to work. And if you're in good shape, when you start, even if you do have severe valve disease, you'll likely do better after surgery or this TAVR procedure we'll talk about. Medications are important. Blood pressure medications keep your blood pressure low. Your heart is pumping against that blood pressure, so it makes it easier for your heart to work. And if you do start retaining fluid, water pills or diuretics are important because it eliminates that fluid. It makes it easier for you to breathe and um, more comfortable to put your shoes on. We're going to talk about the minimally invasive TAVR procedure in detail, but I want to emphasize that open heart aortic valve replacement surgery, so replacing that aortic valve when it's time, is often still the right answer for many patients, and it's a very good sur surgery. It's a gold standard for many years, but now um, there are other options, but it's important to know that these, all of this treatment plan is tailored to you. It, it's based on what your valve looks like, your heart looks like, what other medical problems you have, how old you are, and all of those important um, points are taken into account to determine what is gonna be most beneficial to you and you alone. Thank you, Dr. Banerjee. So at this point, we are going to open another poll. Um, we do want to hear again from our audience and you all are doing so great there's a lot of comments that have been entered we really appreciate that so now let's hear again from you on how you personally are currently caring for your heart health maybe it's diet and exercise maybe it is exams and evaluations maybe it's prescriptions medications or you're planning potentially a procedure or a surgery or something entirely different. Um, let me go ahead and launch this now. You should see the poll. Please go ahead and vote and share with us kind of where you're at today and currently caring for your own heart health. This is great. You can see the participation rates rising. Just open it for a few more seconds here. And again, uh, use that chat uh, if there's something else that you would like to share with us. Great, we've got about 70%, 75%. Leave it open for a couple more seconds here. And there are some people commenting just to share this out. I'll close the poll. Now, um, there are some people commenting that they uh, have had previous procedures. So let me share these results out. And how do they look? What are, um, what are, are our audience members doing currently, Dr. Banerjee? Well, this is so, this warms my, my heart because I like to see that the predominant um, result is diet, exercise, and prevention, because that's so important. Regardless of how many pills you take and how many procedures you have, if you're not taking care of the rest of your body, um, it's going to fail you at some point. And so staying away from processed foods and sticking with a low salt diet, staying active, I really truly believe in use it or lose it is really important. Um, this regular exams and evaluations is a really high scoring one by your physician. And that's good because you can't be held responsible for figuring out if you have valve disease or other heart disease, and it's important to go to a specialist or an expert in your body. Um, that's followed by heart medications and prescriptions, which if prescribed to are, are prescribed for a reason, that's important to be compliant with those. And then 10% is planning a heart procedure or surgery, and then another 3% other. Great. Yeah, some of the comments for the other just, um, 
you know, folks are sharing that they've had um, different procedures and used different prevention me methods. So it's, it's awesome. Thank you all for sharing this with us in the notes. I'll go ahead and close this um, survey and let's transition back to the slides. Thank you, Summer. One of the things I really wanted to focus on is, especially as part of the, the structural heart space, which is valvular heart disease procedures, but really in all of medicine, peace health is really emphasized the multidisciplinary heart team approach. And that includes not only your interventional cardiologist or your cardiac, cardiothoracic surgeon, who you think of as the person who's doing that procedure or that surgery, but the anesthesiologist who is making sure you're comfortable and safe during those procedures, the staff in the, in the cath lab where we do some of these procedures or the operating room who makes sure the, the show is running smoothly, the echocardiographer who is helping us visualize the heart, and then the perfusionist who is making sure all, all the lines we would need for any open heart surgery are clean and fresh and available and of course the all the um the staff including all of our nurses our physician assistants people who are um, involved in coordinating research all of these people are integral to making everything work and i would emphasize to you regardless of where you go for care to go somewhere where there is a lot of experience we have had um, over 10 years of experience in the structural heart space and it's important because you want to go somewhere where it's high volume so that you learn from from experience as well as moved along and evolved with the technology um, our approach with the heart team is important because you're getting a perspective from other not just your own view. Uh, it's not just me thinking about the patient in the valve, but it's the anesthesiologist thinking about all the other medical problems and how someone's going to recover from anesthesia. And the surgeon thinking about how are these vessels looking and how would this person do with aortic valve replacement versus TAVR? And how are all of, all of us getting together to talk about this and choosing the right therapy for the patient, understanding how they're going to do afterwards, and then continuing to follow them. I think it's um, what makes everything successful and it's so patient oriented and is really the way that medicine is evolving and I think is why um, we're going to be able to offer such great care for our patients. So TAVR in specifically has been just a boon to us because aortic valve replacement is often a surgery that comes up when people are older. It starts maybe in your 60s and 70s, but a lot of patients are in their 80s and 90s. And 15 years ago, when someone thought of this new procedure, they were thinking, wow, there's a lot of people who are, even if they, we wanted to, they would be too high risk for open heart surgery. What can we do? And at that time, it was, it was not as clearly understood. And when we adopted this early on, um, it was a procedure where we would have to still put every patient under general anesthesia that um, still included some kind of incision, so some cutting. Patients were here for several days and our, our equipment was really big and bulky. And that has really evolved over time. So over the last 10 years, we like to call it futuristic because it feels like we're living in um, a really great era where things are evolving quickly, becoming safer, and becoming um, better for the patients and easier for the patients. So TAVR is less invasive than open heart surgery. We have a balloon expandable valve, which I'll explain to you, which is makes it easy for us to implant. We also have other more than one valve available so we can fit the valve to the patient. What has made this such a popular procedure is that the outcomes are favorable to open heart surgery. And in some cases, um, it's even safer because you don't open the heart and because the recovery is easier. And we've had recent advances like a Sentinel, which is a filter that filters clot or debris from coming up to the brain that decreases a risk of stroke during TAVR and provides even additional safety. So 
we're evolving, things are always changing and becoming safer and becoming more available to, to our patient population. So how does it work? So um, I'll emphasize this a little bit later on, but it takes a lot of work to make sure somebody's a candidate for this procedure. It's not like we can just take a listen, hear a murmur, and then decide that someone can, can get a TAVR. We want to do a thorough workup and make sure that someone's a good candidate, a better candidate than open heart surgery, and also maybe better candidate than doing nothing. And that's really important and part of our whole system-based approach for that whole group. We meet every week with all of those people I talked about, surgeons, nurses, anesthesiologists, and make the best plan based on all the testing we do to determine if someone's a candidate. But once they are, the procedure is, is fairly simple as things go. Um, a patient is, is in the OR. It's a cold room. I always warn them. It's a cold room. We clean you off with cold soap. We give you medicine so you don't care. So not usually general anesthesia, although that's used for some patients. So some patients will still need a breathing tube. But mostly, 95% of our patients have conscious sedation, which means they're sleepy but not completely asleep, very much similar to when you have a colonoscopy. So we take the valve, the cow is, it, or the valve is cow or pig tissue, and it's loaded onto a metal stent just to give it a framework. We take that whole thing and we crimp it onto a plastic tube that's about the size of a pen. Now there's usually no cutting involved. We go through an IV in the leg, all the arteries lead back to the heart. So we take that whole contraption, a hollow plastic tube, an uninflated balloon, and that valve that's crimped onto it is a small profile. We take it all the way up to where that diseased valve is, and then we blow up the balloon. We use x-ray to determine where we are. So we blow up the balloon. We don't take the old valve out. We actually just push it out of the way and use that crusty calcium that made it thick and inflexible as an anchor for, the, for that, was, that stent or that metal framework so that it doesn't move. And then we withdraw the plastic tube and the uninflated balloon, and the valve sits there, as you can see in that third picture. And that's pretty much how simple that procedure is. We're able to remove the big IV, put a suture or a stitch where that big IV was in the leg, and, um, and the heart starts working, or the valve starts working immediately. What's really been an amazing process to be a part of is when we first started this, I mentioned because it was such a new procedure that it was only available for patients that were too sick for open heart surgery. But since it's been around and evolved and improved over the last 10 years and continues to be new and exciting, we found that since the valve is just as durable as the valve as we use for open heart surgery, it lasts about 10 to 15 years. Um, and that it is low risk in terms of bleeding and stroke and other things that we associate with valve replacement, that it's become available to a much larger population of patients. And so this is an article that references that these valves should be considered for all patients with aortic stenosis. Of course, they have to go through the process to determine if they're a candidate, but it makes it much more mainstream and much more exciting as we talk about expanding this technology to other valves and other valve disease. So the TAVR train, it's an important thing. We talk about it all the time. As I mentioned, not everybody is a candidate for TAVR. It seems simple and exciting and, and may be what most patients and people would choose if they had a choice, um, but not everybody's a candidate. And we do a really thorough workup to make sure that someone is getting the therapy that they need. And so, of course, the first thing that has to happen is someone has to identify severe aortic stenosis. That would either be the primary care provider or the cardiologist. And then we commence some testing. And so the testing includes a CT scan. That CT scan is a special x-ray that gives us a roadmap of the arteries, the arteries in the legs to make sure they're big enough for us to work through. 
the artery right where the valve is so we can figure out what size of valve we need. And then other arteries, such as the arteries in the neck and in the arm, in case the arteries in the legs are too small, we do have options to use other access points. We always do a carotid duplex, and that's an ultrasound of the artery feeding your brain to understand what stroke risk would be. A lung test to make sure there's no reason that you would have a side, side effect from anesthesia, and also to determine if your shortness of breath is a result of the valve or something else going on. Every patient, whether they get open heart surgery or TAVR, receives a coronary angiogram. And that you may know that by as, as other names, such as a heart catheterization or a heart cath. That is the test where we fill the arteries feeding your heart with dye or contrast to see if there's any blockages. Your arteries are just pipes, and over time they get built up like any pipes do, and you want to make sure there's no risk of having a heart attack during any procedure we do on the heart. And then finally, lab work. We need to make sure kidney function is normal, blood counts are normal, and understand what the whole patient looks like before we proceed with TAVR or any other therapy. So what takes a person off the train? One of the main things that, that will do that if, is if there's too many other medical problems. If you have severe disease such as cancer and you're not gonna, and, and that's your main complaint and it's not treated or untreatable or other organ damage that's not reversible um, and we know that we can't make you better or live longer with a TAVR procedure, then we're not gonna do a procedure just for the sake of doing it because we can. We wanna make sure it's a benefit for our patients. A lot of times people get excited, and by people I mean physicians, and send us any patient with a murmur, and the valve may not be severely narrowed. And so we often have to say, okay, you're not there yet, but we'll continue to follow you closely. But there's no benefit of replacing a valve that's not severely narrow, and there are risks, and so we wanna make sure we we place it at the ideal time. And then patient choice. We are here to offer you therapy, to educate you, to give you the knowledge that we have from our experience and our education. And there are some times that a patient may be older or may not want to put their bodies at any kind of risk. And it's always the patient's choice whether we move forward or not. So I thought it's a picture is worth a thousand words. And so here is a picture of two reasons we couldn't um, move forward with TAVR on these patients. And the first picture on your left shows kind of that roadmap I told you about. These are both CT scans of the arteries in your abdomen and your legs. And you can see that they're twisty and um, not a straight line. And so we call that tortuous. And so you can imagine trying to take this contraption, this valve that's crimped onto a balloon and try to navigate that twistiness and you could really cause damage to the vessel and so that patient was not a candidate of a TAVR through the legs but I think we did end up finding another access point for this patient. And then the picture on the right shows you that these arteries are super teeny tiny in the legs compared to what you could see on the left side and they were too small for the valve to go through. And so patients who have very small arteries due to blockages or just size in general would not be a candidate for this procedure either. So the TAVR procedure today, again, it's been such an evolution going from patients who are needing a breathing tube, needing an incision to what it is today. The risks we quote to patients are a five to 10 percent risk of needing a permanent pacemaker. And that's because when we blow up that balloon to implant the valve, we squeeze the natural pacemaker you're born with. And so five to 10 percent of people will need a permanent pacemaker, which is usually implanted during that hospitalization. I like to think of it as 95 percent chance you don't need a permanent pacemaker. The next is a one to two percent risk of stroke. Again, quite considerably lower than when TAVR started and lower than open heart surgery. And so we're very proud of that low risk. And most people go home the next day. So we like to say the heart is fixed in the moment. And of course, there are other complications that can happen. Damage to the vessels as we go up or tears in the heart. Those are uncommon. 
but we have plans to fix them and support if, if, if they do occur. But mostly patients go home the next day. Again, the heart is, is fixed and the valve is working almost immediately after implantation. But we want to make sure that there's no bleeding in where we put the big IV. There's no rhythm problems or need for pacemakers. So 24 hours is important for observation. And if there's any, any cause for concern or if someone is coming from far away or just feels weak the next day, we keep them another day. The two valves we're using currently are the Edwards and Medtronic valves, and they're made of cow and pig tissue. And that seems to be very important to patients. They like to know what kind of animal that we're gonna use. But what's important to me is that they're both close enough to human tissue that there's no extra medicines that you need to take. If you're not on an aspirin, you'll be on an aspirin, but if you're already on a blood thinner or um, another kind of super aspirin such as Plavix, those will just be continued. Thank you, uh, Dr. Banerjee. So at this point in time, um, no, we don't have another poll for you, but we are going to move into um, our uh, next topic of mitral regurgitation. So if there's anything that you have um, question-wise on TAVR, feel free to enter that into our chat. We're gonna hold all chats until the end, where so we'll end with about 10, 15 minutes of um, question and answer. So feel free to put those in now so um, you don't forget. And then we'll go ahead and move into the mitral regurgitation portion. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, so Eric stenosis, I hope everybody is an expert on that now, and we'll talk about mitral regurgitation. So we're going from that narrow block valve to the leaky valve. So the mitral valve, as you can see here, is, is, the t is connecting the top chamber of the heart to the bottom chamber. So the blood is coming back, the oxygen-rich blood is coming back from the lungs, coming to the top chamber of the heart through the mitral valve, and then being pumped to all your vital organs. And so what it's supposed to do is open really nice and wide, let the blood fill that major pump, and then close and form a nice tight seal. But some people are either born with a slightly abnormal valve or they have a heart attack or an infection or something that causes that leaflet not to seal appropriately. And so every time that heart is squeezing, the blood goes forward, but a considerable amount can go backwards as well. This can also happen if you have heart failure. So heart failure has become one of the major diseases in this country. And when you have heart failure, your heart muscle can get weak. And when it gets weak, it can stretch that bottom chamber. And when it stretches, it stretches those leaflets apart. So they open well, but they still can't form that nice seal because they're tethered apart from each other. So every time, again, every time you squeeze, you're having blood go forward, but some of it's going backward, leading to that fluid accumulation and also leading to not enough blood going where it needs to go, to your vital organs and to your muscles. So the therapies for mitral regurgitation, again, importantly tailored to the patient, tailored to you. It matters whether the mitral valve is not working because of heart failure or if it's another process like infection or what we call congenital or what you're born with, or if it's a result of a heart attack. It matters what that valve looks like. Low salt diet and activity are just as important here as they were with aortic stenosis and regular checkups and monitoring to see how severe that leaking is, if it's impacting the heart, and determining when the right time to replace or repair these valves is. It's really important to be compliant with your medication regimen, make sure you take blood pressure medicine, make sure that you're taking your water pill if you're accumulating fluid again. But the kind of hallmark of valve disease is that we can treat with medications but we can't fix. And so just like with the aortic valve where eventually you need to replace it, whether with TAVR or open heart surgery, with mitral regurgitation or leaking, you need to somehow decrease that leaking, whether it's with the mitral clip procedure or with open heart repair where they can keep the same leaflets and repair it or actually replace the whole valve. And that's very much determined by what that mitral valve looks like.
So one of the most um, kind of astounding things to me, and Summer, I'll have you click through it because some other numbers I think might show up here, is that this is 2009. So these numbers have increased, if anything, in the last 10 years. More than 4 million patients had mitral regurgitation. 1.6 million of those had severe mitral regurgitation and needed treatments. And only 30,000 of those 1.6 million were actually treated with surgery and mitral clip wasn't really as common then. And so that's a huge number of patients. And a lot of the reason that patients with mitral regurgitation don't get treated is that the symptoms can be really vague. So just like we talked about before, you can get chest pain, you can get symptoms of fluid overload and accumulation, but a lot of it is just fatigue or feeling like you're getting old. And, you know, I'm not discounting that you might get weaker or less active as you get older due to arthritis or other issues. But if there's not a good reason for what it is, it's important to talk to your doctor because we're really under treating um, this disease, especially compared to aortic stenosis. And what's important about treating mitral valve disease is if you think about it, every time that left ventricle, that main pumping chamber squeezes, some of the blood goes forward, but let's say a third of it goes back during severe mitral regurgitation. So the heart muscle first gets thick, just like any muscle that you work out, but then eventually gets weak because it's just working so hard. And so then the weaker it gets, the more it stretches, which makes the leaflets of the mitral valve stretch and makes the leaking worse, which then makes the heart function worse. And so it becomes this vicious cycle. And it's important to start treating it as soon as it's identified. As I mentioned before, heart failure is becoming a really common diagnosis in our patient population. And so we want to identify those patients that have heart failure and mitral regurgitation because we could they, these patients can really benefit from the mitral clip procedure or from um, aggressive treatment of their heart failure so that leaking doesn't get worse. So how does the mitral clip procedure work? And this is, again, really exciting and really much newer than TAVR. It's been around for a while, but again, advances in the technology and understanding which patients would benefit from this have really changed how we're able to offer this and who we're able to offer it to and really changed um, how many hospitalizations, how sick people are, and even improved um, mortality from heart failure. So with this, um, procedure, you actually do get general anesthesia. And that's because you're laying on this OR bed, which is kind of like an ironing board and really painful <laughs> if you have to stay there for any amount of time. And we use both x-ray and ultrasound to help visualize the valve as we treat it. And so that ultrasound is in your throat, which can also be uncomfortable if you're awake. And so this is general anesthesia, can take two to five hours still just working through an IV. So an IV in the vein in your leg. We take this clip, which you can see here, and it's a, on a long catheter because it has to go all the way from your leg all the way up to the mitral valve. So we get up to the right side of your heart, cross through the top two chambers down, looking from that left atrium, which is that top chamber getting the blood from the lungs down at the mitral valve. And I joke about this, but I like to say that we're better than that arcade game where you have the claw that tries to get the stuffed animal because we have all this imaging available to us. That's a good visual. <laughs> and so we make sure that we get a good, good um, bit of tissue in each of those um, clips, you can see that they're on that top right picture. There's a kind of a pincer on each side. We make sure we get a good pinch of, of tissue from each side of the valves. Thank you. And bring those leaflets together. Now, this is still going to allow the valve to open and allow for blood flow through it. But 
it will also allow it to seal rather than keeping those leaflets apart and diminish the leaking. Some people need more than one clip, but we have been, we call it successful if we're able to decrease that leaking substantially. Unless there's some catastrophic um, complication, which is very rare because we're just working through an IV, almost everybody goes home the next day. Again, there's just a suture or a, or a um, kind of tie to keep that big IV closed, and then your heart should be um, working better almost immediately. So the recovery time, we say that people can go back to normal activity within four or five days just to let the groin heal. And then we have fo close follow-up with these patients as well as our TAVR patients within a week and then within 30 days. So we're always watching and being careful and making sure that um, everybody is comfortable with the, with the follow-up. So in summary, I hope that you feel comfortable with these new technologies and understand that there is an important role for them. They may not be available for everybody, but they are increasingly available to our population. And we're so excited to offer something that's less invasive and people recover from and um, can get back to their daily lives more quickly. If you're having symptoms of murmurs or you know you've had one and haven't been followed up, it's important to get an exam or maybe an echocardiogra echocardiogram. If you're having any chest pain for any reason that's new and has to do with activity and you're concerned about it, don't hesitate to get evaluated. And shortness of breath, although it could be from the heart and it could be either heart blockages or valvular heart disease as well as lung disease, it's important just to be your advocate and um, see what's out there that could make you feel better and live longer. Thank you so much, Dr. Banerjee. I um, always learn so much. You really have helped me expand my own knowledge around innovative heart care treatments that Peace Health offers today. I hope our audience uh, and listeners also uh, got their uh, knowledge uh, expanded as well. Um, I'm going to give our audience a, a minute to add any additional questions for you in the chat. And while that's happening, I do want to remind folks that a recording of this webinar will be available. So if you want to rewatch it or if you want to share it with a friend or family member who also might be interested, you um, will be receiving an update with a link. We will post that um, likely sometime after uh, today. We usually try to do it same day. Um, and then these slides too will also be available. So you can download those. And um, this slide also contains our, um, our website. So moving into uh, the q and A. It looks like we do have about 10 minutes here, so this is great and lots of great questions. So let me go back up to the top here, and I'll just pose um, one of the first ones I was I was interested in too specifically. Um, this one comes from Bradley, um, and Bradley asks, "How do the signs and symptoms differ between male and female?" some more prevalent than others with a given gender. Is that, is there anything there between um, kind of gender differences that you see? That's a fantastic question. Thank you, Bradley. Um, you know, we talk about that a lot when we talk about coronary artery disease or heart blockages because the chest pain and symptoms really differ um, in the way it's expressed, whether you have diabetes, whether you're a woman or a man, and that could be more atypical for women and diabetics in the sense that you can get back pain or jaw pain rather than the elephant sitting on your chest. Um, but it's not as common for valve disease. I can tell you in my experience over the last 10 years, it's very much what I tried to illustrate today on that pictogram, just thinking about it as a lack of blood flow to vital organs, whether it's dizziness and lightheadedness or fainting, going to the brain, the shortness of breath because of lack of blood flow to the lungs or chest pain because of lack of blood flow to the heart. And then any signs of accumulations of fluid and that's whether it's in the abdomen or in the legs or in the lungs. So thank you for that question. Great, thank you. Um, here's one from Marlene. Um, this one's interesting. It's related to um, medication. So after getting a new valve with a history of AFib, can a person still take blood thinners? 
That's a great question because it comes out all the time. And if you're anybody who's watching late night TV, they're going to tell you that you can't take blood thinners if you have valve disease. And that was historically the case because we wanted to make sure that we were treating we're treating patients with this new class of medications that were not warfarin, but we, we first call the NOAX, the newer anticoagulants, and then the DOAX, the direct, the direct anticoagulants. Just to confuse people further, those are what you might know as Eliquis or Prodexa or Xarelto. Those are medications that we say should be used for non-valvular atrial fibrillation, but those guidelines have changed and the recommendations are unless that valve disease is mitral stenosis or narrowing of the mitral valve, you can still take those medications. So yes, we have plenty of patients who come in, they've been on Eliquis, for example, for atrial fibrillation. They now have severe aortic stenosis and they undergo TAVR. We stop the Eliquis just for the procedure, just like we do for any invasive procedure, and then re resume it um, the following day. So I hope that makes sense. Yeah. So don't worry so much, but if you do have concerns about your heart in particular, please ask your physician. Absolutely. Yes, thank you, Dr. Banerjee. Um, I'm gonna try to get as many questions okay. answered as possible, um, but we probably won't be able to get them all. You all are doing a great job asking, so we may um, do a follow-up kind of Q&A document as well as one of the handouts. We'll, we'll see how that uh, goes, but don't don't worry too much if we can't get all of your questions answered. We will try to get back to you. Um, so this next one is uh, also interesting to me. Are there any pros and cons or differences between the cow or the pig valves? Well, I think it depends on what kind of meat you like to eat. But no, <laughs> I had one patient who named her cow valve Bessie, which I thought was really adorable. But um, that's a really good question. They're actually both very durable. At this point in time, we're using the cow valve as the balloon expandable. So the so the valve that I described to you where it's crimped onto a balloon and we take it up to where that crunchy valve is and blow it up, that's a cow valve. We know it's very durable, um, but we do use a self-expanding valve. So instead of blowing up that balloon, we have a valve that we can just take up and it's kind of encased in a really small catheter and we kind of unsheath it so it expands as it comes across your um, your native aortic valve, and that's pig tissue. Both of them are durable. If there was a case that one was more durable than the other, then the other one just wouldn't be used because what we want is to minimize procedures for our patients and give them as much longevity as possible. So good question. We do use those two valves for different patient types depending on how much calcium you have or if you have heart failure, that really determines which valve we choose for you. But they're both durable and have really good safety data as well as long-term outcomes. Thank you, Dr. Banerjee. And this next one comes from Michael. Is a person with a mechanical mitral valve a possible candidate for a TAVR? That's a good question too. These are wonderful. Um, yes, the answer is yes. So. We do have a couple of mechanical mitral valves that if you could see on that picture, and if you, I don't know if you can refer back to it, the mitral valve and aortic valve are quite close to each other. And the um, depending on what kind of mechanical mitral valve you have, sometimes it can try to interfere with putting in a TAVR, but we have yet to have a um, situation that we are unable to do that. So there may be one or two much older valves that we were unable to, we were hesitant or cautious about, but most of the time it should not preclude you from getting a TAVR. And it may even be a reason to have one because if someone has already had their chest cut open, we try not to do it again. And so if someone has had bypass surgery, for example, and had a sternotomy or had their sternum cut open or a mitral valve surgery before, you know, it's it's some, there's a lot of scar tissue, and we we really take that into consideration when deciding what kind of procedure to do next. Thank you. Um, there's a few questions. I'm going to try to sort of combine these and just get um, you to comment on. Um, in general, people are curious. 
what happens sort of after the valve, you know, expiration time? There's a 10 to 15 years that some folks have been typing into chat and people are curious if there's like second procedures or if open heart surgery is needed or could you comment on sort of that, you know, how long these valves last and sort of what to do after you've reached that time, including paying attention to signs and symptoms and talking uh, with your doctor at your regular checkups? Absolutely. So any patient who gets a tissue valve, so a mechanical valve, the metal is not going to deteriorate. So if they have a mechanical mitral valve or aortic valve, those don't deteriorate. We tend to place those um, valves in patients who are younger so that they won't have to worry about this expiration date. And it's not really an expiration date. It's kind of our best guess. Older valves, whether they were surgical or TAVR, tissue valves, again, whether they were a pig or a cow, lasted about 10 years. We're seeing now longer times, and so that's encouraging, and that's why I gave you that range of 10 to 15 percent. Let's say somebody who's 70 has a TAVR valve, and then in 12 years, at 82, that valve over time gets fibrose, just like the native valve did. And so the leaflets get thicker, and they now have stenosis of their TAVR valve. You can get a tav another TAVR valve in that valve. So you can actually have a TAVR in a TAVR. We're not sure that you can do a TAVR in a TAVR in a TAVR. So we kind of get one chance at that. And so that has really informed how we go about this. Because let's say you're 60. If you're 60, you come in, you have Eric stenosis. If we put a TAVR in you, let's say it lasts 15 years and we do another one when you're 75. But now that one only lasts until you're 85, and we're trying to, starting to expect some of our patients to last till they're 100. Um, when do you, what is the right thing for patients? And in, in that case, the initial surgery might be open heart surgery. So you might get an open heart surgery, a huge valve that we can get that can expand over time, and then say, okay, at 60, you get a surgical aortic valve. And then the next two get TAVR, and that should get to 200. So all of these things are what we're thinking of when we meet each patient. And that's why I said it's tailored specifically to the patient, what other medical problems they've had, if they've had open heart surgery, how old they are because of how long the valves last. But the process is that the leaflets get thickened over time. We can't predict how long it's going to be, but we can watch it. We watch it every year, regardless of what kind of valve you get with an echocardiogram. So we'll find it when it becomes to be a problem. Thank you so much, Dr. Banerjee. We only have a couple of minutes left in our hour, so I am going to um, move us along here and uh, show you this next slide. We do um, want you to connect with us um, by visiting our website at peacehealth.org slash heart health for managing um, your journey. Uh, we know that uh, you might be um, experiencing some heart concerns and that managing heart disease really is a journey filled with a lot of important decisions along the way. Hopefully this session has provided you with some insight personally and also insight that you might want to share with your friends or family members. Um, so we do want to encourage you bookmark our site to learn more request a consult with our cardiology team, and find resources such as our heart risk assessment for those who maybe haven't been diagnosed. We also have downloadable guides that explain these advanced procedures that we discussed today and why you might wanna consider Peace Health for your care. Finally, uh, we do value your feedback. After you close out of this session, you'll be prompted to complete our short survey. I look forward to reading your evaluation so that we can improve our webinars for next time. And just wanna finally thank all of you for spending your lunchtime with us today. And a very special thanks to our presenter, Dr. Banerjee, for sharing her expertise on heart valve disease therapies. Until next time, stay healthy and be well. Thank you.